and said, here's a ticket, order the SMS, just go take a print out of the airport. Two industries get a distribution through one, but then the actual product was actually from somewhere else. You work on a lot of research projects. Me may not have a direct impact on business. How does one build a sustainable business by selling to Indian banks and financial services? Dollar spent on marketing scaled to 200,000. Keep on your side, it's a permanent virus for life. It was a trust issue, not a payment issue. That problem has still not been solved, by the way. People don't look at the 1516 years, they look at that 1516 seconds of pain. But uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the Aadhaar experience there. And that was a time where I think, you know, everything was, you know, the, the end goal was, was there that India should be able to transfer benefits uh, with minimal leakage because NGA, uh, Mandrega and all these programs had anywhere from 10 to 90 percent leakage is what they would say. Uh, and I think uh, that was an opportunity and, you know, really have to credit the government for allowing uh, Nandan and team, you know, Shrikant, Pramod, all of them to, and Sanjay Jain to join, to really look at this as a new age infrastructure for the next 100 years or the next 50 years and say, okay, what is the current state of the art, not what has somebody else done, right? Because the default expectation was that everybody would do a smart card. And in fact, I had written a blog about if you're going to do a smart card, do the SIM card because it's a network enabled smart card. You get all the benefits of a smart card. And I thought Government of India could certainly, if MCheck could put a client on two telcos, Government of India could probably put a client on all telcos. All telcos. And everybody would have a, a very secure element which is linked to their ID. Uh, but I think we went, you know, two steps even further and said there should be no token at all. You know, you are your ID, you're the, the, in, the device isn't your ID, right, or the, the, the card. Uh, although people still use the word Aadhaar card today. Um, but the, the decision to go all biometric, you know, do a one-time sweep of the population and get everybody in the system is a really almost ludicrous solution, right, for, to the problem. But it was such a, you know, because we said we don't want to inherit anything, right? Yes, banks had some KYC data, telcos had some KYC data, but the best thing to do is start de novo. And that was a two-year uh, phase where I got to see a little bit of how the government thinks and really how much of competence there is in the government. Because we kind of like to, you know, private sector and that entrepreneurs try to cynically say, well, you know, the smart guys really don't go there. Right. But we saw interacting with several of the IAS officers and of course someone like, you know, Ram Sevak Sharma, who is later shown, you know, five times over, including the whole pandemic, uh, you know, distribution of the vaccine and stuff. So we found some extraordinary people there and the bar was very high. But the constraint for the government is you cannot say that, oh, 0.1% of the population doesn't have eyes and hands, so it doesn't matter. Right. Because you have to serve everybody in the car as the government, right? So you do not have a choice. And so everything you do has got to have a mechanism of doing things at complete scale. Um, and then, of course, cost and all these things also, you know, at the end, I don't know if we all know, but Aadhaar was basically like a 50 rupee per enrollment, which at the time was about a dollar, right? And India enrolled the whole country within that uh, price point biometric devices that used to cost two thousand dollars you know for an iris camera by the end it was a you know one and a half dollar part added to a, a cell phone and any phone could become an iris camera right so i think the world has benefited a lot from how india adopted because nobody was buying you know let me buy twenty five thousand you know flatbed fingerprint scanners right people would buy 25 right? and all of a sudden india was ordering them at scale and um, it was sort of a very unique experience, but I remember the work I did there was sort of on uh, looking at applications of Aadhaar and that's where Shripati and I actually worked together uh, and uh, with Bala as well. Uh, and, and, and Raj Mashruwala was sort of very core involved with you know, Pramod and Sanjay on the choice of the biometrics, the mechanism. They actually innovated a lot there, right? So for example, the choice of the biometric system 
was you know in all of these bidding government things you have l1 bidder l2 bidder and so on so the business actually so they were not paid for the, the software they were paid on the usage of the software right maybe some flat fee plus the usage and the usage was based on the total cost of ownership mm-hmm. so if you improved your algorithms and the cost of doing your biometric auth came down you would get next quarter you will get i don't know 70% of the business whereas the second guy will get 30 so they kept them sort of motivated to continue to keep uh, improving their systems right so it's sort of very unusual things that the government did and um, you know this whole idea of doing authentication and then eventually ekyc uh, these are things that were sort of game changing right because all of a sudden here was a digitally signed confirmation of you know your proof of id Uh, which is valid in the court of law because india had this you know uh, adoption of digital signatures very early on and i think that you know people will look back at it you know and we've seen several studies now that say that you know india has leapfrog banking what should have taken 45 years has happened in 6 years in india etc so it was a extraordinary you know experience and this one has actually been something that i've been privileged enough to be part of but also shared around the world and then later on the work that happened on the whole india stack which led to sort of a lot of the stuff you are doing now with account aggregator and so on so we'll trace that journey a bit uh, but in parallel the wallet story started right and maybe anshul you can share a little bit about your view because that was around the time you were getting into entrepreneurship and uh, so on yeah yeah so our journey started i think uh, after i finished my two years at microsoft uh, we started with uh, we said uh, in bmtc buses when you pay 10 rupees that guy will actually write 2 rupees at the back of the ticket and hand it over to you and say ki baad mein collect kar lena right and then uh, we were like look, why should give i your toffee or, or give you a toffee right like so we were right ki why should i leave my 2 rupees to this guy right like we should solve this problem it should be a solvable problem so the literally the first idea that we started working on was that uh, uh how do we make these transactions cashless uh the very first product that we built was uh, uh a rfid reader that we can give one reader in every bus and like a rfid cards that can be uh loaded you can basically give like 500 rupees cash we'll tap it to the reader we'll get loaded with 500 bucks and then every time whichever bus you go to you can keep using consuming that 500 rupees cash was the product we built we went to bmtc of course uh, we were not lucky enough like iscc so i mean you pay us 20 rupees <laughs> no the ex- people were expecting favors we really we of course had no money uh, to crack any deal with them and uh, and we realized that look as a very young startup it's super hard to have a psu as your first customer like you can't crack it right and um, and uh, they say ki okay what problem are we trying to solve the problem that we are trying to solve is the uh, of this whole small change people still paying in cash right so it's like why don't we take it a notch above right and then solve it for a generic peer to peer right and uh, that's when we said look let's build uh, uh, paypal on mobile numbers right so paypal at that point in time you know every account is basically linked to an email id we said everyone uh, has everyone else a mobile number in their mobile right but they don't have their email ids so imagine if i can actually make payment to sanjay directly to his mobile number uh, and then sanjay can decide whether he wants to transfer that money to his account or utilize that essentially a wallets play uh, we said okay let's now pivot from this whole bmtc idea to a focus on peer to peer we to be very frank didn't know there is something called ppi license required by rbi and what not we actually only built the product said okay let's build the product and just few weeks before we were trying to launch uh we were told look guys this is a regulated space and uh, you know you can't you can't just do it right <laughs> like yeah, yeah. So, please <laughs> please go and talk to the regulator so like look, of course we didn't have again uh we didn't know how to apply for the license of course we didn't have any money to apply for the license um so say so what do we do what i did uh, i think uh, went to rbi downloaded the list of people 
uh, who already had the PPI license. I said, we'll go and partner with one of these guys. Uh, uh, maybe someone will have a good set of APIs that we could consume and we could use whatever powered by ABC, right? Um, from that entire list that I saw, I said, Ki humse koi baat nahi karega. Really, we are just two of us. No one will talk to us. I found one guy called, uh, there's an entity called Zipcash, right? Uh, the founder is ex-Microsoft. I said, isko pagarte hain. Right? He'll at least meet, right? I'll use my ex, my Microsoft link. I'll message him, message him on LinkedIn. I said, look, I'm um, ex-Microsoft founder trying to build something in the space. Can I come? I said, sure. So I went to his place uh, based out of Mumbai. But I realized that uh, they had zero tech in place at that point in time, right? Like they had the license, but they weren't doing much uh, about that license. So I literally sat with the CTO there, wrote the specs uh, and said, okay, now please develop these, uh, the entire infra at your end so that we could consume. Let me develop it for you on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so that he could consume. And um, we finally launched after a couple of months, we launched uh, uh, the wallet business, right? Uh, and uh, said powered by Zipcash. One interesting learning at that point in time uh, uh, in wallet business was, look, uh, the loading was happening through a PG, a payment gateway. And you have to make at least two plus to make some business out of it. Right. So the one experiment that we did, I said, Ki if I need to pay Sanjay, let's say 100 bucks. Uh, I will, the money that will get deducted from my account will be 100, but Sanjay will get only 98. I said, everyone started shouting at us. He said, was 100 rupees jayega, 100 rupees milega. 98 business will not work. Uh, I said, okay, then how do we make money? Um, then we started putting thing, okay, the merchant will pay us. Because we are making some life easy and then we started putting a proprietary non-interoperable QR codes at the different merchant locations. Um, so which years is this? This was uh, back in 2014, 12, 13? 2014. Okay, 14. 20, 20, late 2013 actually, early 2014, yeah. And um, we said, uh, okay, why don't we uh, start acquiring merchants? Uh, so we were two of us. And uh, we used to have 60 interns, six zero interns, right? Like my developer, my app was being developed by an intern, our marketing was, was done by an intern and those 60 interns would have like four leads to whom we will pay like a 5,000 rupees per month and rest of the 56 interns would get a certificate. <laughs> I had no money to pay, we can't afford to hire anyone. Right, so that's how we got the job done. And those 56 guys used to be in so much enthu. What they would do is, uh, they will actually make videos, uh, act in the videos, transact with each other in the video and then try to make that video viral within their college group. So we became quite famous uh, in a, like a young population, college students. Uh, early professionals, right? Like uh, we scaled to some 200,000 users. Zero dollar spent on marketing scaled to 200,000 users. Uh, we realized, look, we are still not making any money. <laughs> I'm actually, we are still burning money because you know, for any, any rupee that goes into the wallet, we are actually using 2% on it, right? Um, so the next thing that we said, okay, why don't we make it the go the Campus is cashless because we are now famous in colleges. We go college by college and make these colleges cashless and acquire the merchants in that college because it's a concentrated effort and uh, the concentrated set of users. We'll keep getting business plans to do this, by the way. So <laughs> today, 15 years later, yeah. Flip them over. <laughs> <laughs> so. But everything is you, about timing, as they say, yeah. Do you know the think. CMRIT, right? Uh, here in Whitefield, right? So we. We went to CMRIT and we actually turned the entire campus into cashless. We ran that for a, you know, I think for a couple of weeks, we ran that experiment. And all of that was working fine, but we realized that the only way to make money in this business is to sort of pump in um, 
billions of dollars look billions is probably no longer available now right yeah. millions of dollars <laughs> uh, into the business to create the to to uh, to create the behavior change or or i would say build the entire base first and then monetize that base later with the with a different set of products wallets at that point in time the core usp for the wallet was the convenience and there was nothing else so 2fa came in and uh, the wallet the 2fa was not mandatory on the wallet so the only use case for the wallet was uh, that you would sort of load in money and then it will automatically get deducted right like the whole paytm uber deal that happened right? like pay uber was like an anchor customer for paytm and it was a game changer for them and the only reason uber got paytm was that at the end of the ride if you have a balance in paytm it will automatically get deducted because there was no 2fa right uh, so that was the only core usp but user experience wise user experience wise but look now all of that upi has of course have taken away that that also <laughs> so, so maybe we'll uh, switch a little bit shikant to that phase you were back at amex and then later joined amazon right uh, the time anshul was talking about um i have a f- funny story about how about my first meeting with anshul which i'll talk about uh, in a bit uh, but uh, so what were you seeing from the uh, i guess the amex side and of course the the big thing that happened in that phase was sort of the emergence of atm as well right across the board uh, merchants whether it was online and so on and of course then then upi came a little later but be good to hear you know from the perspective of the bigger companies how did you see all of this emerging and uh, uh, yeah the thinking and both at an individual level as well as at a corporate level correct correct so um see so once um once you cross over to the entrepreneur side it's a permanent virus for life right i mean all of us know that i mean it's a it's almost like a gene mutation that can never be <laughs> cannot be reversed unwound right so that mindset stays with you right and um when i joined back anamix part of it was uh, because after after the startup you know uh, went bust and then nokia money also didn't uh, scale too too much because of different you know larger issues um sanjay rishi at that time uh, i don't know whether you know him uh, yep you know um he was setting up a so called digital unit anamix and i reached out to him and he said um, hey this is actually the best of both worlds we have a guy who understands anamix and who also has built something on the outside from ground up want to come and build it for us so the initial 6 to 12 months was fabulous because we were operating as a startup within a very large organization we had all the tools and resources of and the technology uh, you know capabilities of a large organization but the freedom to operate very very um, fast and uh, you know in a very very agile way so we actually launched a couple of products which was a one click checkout right Uh, which would work across any uh, website any any uh, e-commerce merchant um and then amazon came calling amazon at that time uh, to put things in context in 2013 when i joined um the website was 5 weeks old oh wow and we were very happily selling books and cd's and feeling you know we were doing a fantastic job you know it's just just getting started right um so at that time i joined the payments team uh that's that had become my core by that time and the payments team was three or four people and the number one charter for us was not really make payments better it was kill cash and delivery back in the day about i don't remember the exact numbers now uh, over 65 or 70% of all e-commerce orders across the industry were cash and delivery it turns out that it was a trust issue mm-hmm. not a payments issue right people were still very new to ordering from some website with a promise that will show up in 2 days time no matter how much you work hard to make that you know fulfill that promise of delivery until you've opened that box and seen what is there inside you're not going to part with your cash which sort of was the niche that easy tap went after also right with the payment on delivery so the delivery. assumption was people yeah. did have a credit or a debit card but they wanted to pay after the delivery not exactly. before the delivery right? exactly so the way we uh, our mental model on the whole wallet business was something like this listen we've got the country's largest delivery fleet reaching you at a verified address at your point of convenience and the product catalog to match and the product catalog to match it is a very small delta for us to 
nudge you into opening a wallet mm. right mm. to start with a low or no kyc wallet i think there were categorizations over there up to 2000 up to 5000 there was a, a category of wallets which would allow you to transact without too much of kyc and then you could move the person up the value chain um so combination of these things right a combination of wallets a combination of easy tap i mean they were great partners for us uh, back in my days at amazon what we found is that as you kept reinforcing trust with the customer saying that your stuff will show up on time it will be genuine now take that next step of faith and you know pay at checkout right rather than pay on delivery and then you had various ways of you know nudges and you know little uh, offers saying that okay uh, pay digitally and here is a little delta back to you credit in your wallet and as your wallet wallet balance builds right. builds builds and you say okay now i can actually use this balance for something meaningful what changed the game for us in wallet adoption was really the digital uh, goods when we launched uh, uh, prime movies or videos and the bite sized you know, 50 rupee or 20 rupee transactions that spun the fly that then started creating this habit of paying online and all this stuff and of course then you had all these partnerships with you know um special offers on credit cards co brands and all this stuff so to today i believe less than 15% is still pay on delivery less than 1/5 15% uh, my numbers may be a little off yeah yeah and that also that pay on delivery might also be digital might also right? be digital yeah. yeah right and today i mean why would you not pay digitally when you just have to flash a phone camera yeah. so the the big corporate a uh, view of the wallet and uh, payments ecosystem was an opportunity to remove transaction costs right you remove transaction costs you make the, the uh, delivery experience, experience so much more seamless then all of a sudden you can do crazy stuff like you know scheduled deliveries you're not at home but your package will show up you get a notification you can make the payment right so all of a sudden your being there and your receiving a delivery could be delinked therefore your order turn turn around times your 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 delivery efficiency also went up by uh, uh, many fold so what started as an assumption your point is it's it's a it's a payment problem or it's an instrument availability problem actually as you peel the onion became a trust and uh, habit issue once you solve for that it wasn't easy it wasn't quick because a good part of 2 or 3 years to get it done but then the flywheel started spinning and today amazon payments i believe is its own own business unit it's its own licensed entity has its own set of you know capabilities it's a, it's a it's a business in, uh, on its own very cool right uh maybe anshul will come back to you on um, the the journey with happy itself right because it's sort of going a little back and forth back to like 2015 time frame and um so the the story actually is that anshul met my partners uh, when they were doing this consumer uh, p2p play in uh, delhi at a hotel they had gone for i think the thai event or something right and they said oh it's a uh payments product you should talk to sanjay right and i happened to be in vegas you know what happens in vegas stays in <laughs> vegas as they say but i was actually at the money 2020 conference and um, they said well you should speak to each other so we had a skype audio call at the time and uh, i think the call went very well uh, or at least that's what anshul thought and at some point i kept hearing my name saying sanjay sanjay and it's like oh i had fallen asleep right <laughs> of course my ego did not let me say that to him so i said sounds very interesting we should meet when we are back and back <laughs> good recovery man <laughs> if i had been awake maybe it might not have found it interesting who knows right <laughs> but anyway so they came to bangalore and uh, of course there's a lot of interesting journeys but we uh, decided to invest and i remember we presented him a term sheet at at, at a local <laughs> restaurant and 5 years later he told me his secret to me which is i told we uh, shipati and i presented the term sheet and said okay we'll give you half an hour to think about it <laughs> and he later said we had already decided and we were wondering what do we do for 30 minutes waiting for you guys to come back <laughs> 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 so we all had but it was a you know we were co-located they they moved from delhi they sat in our office and for a good two and a half years till we kicked them out and then they went to the next building uh and of course along the way you know we did the seed and then sequoia came under the a and the b and you know company evolved and morphed actually quite dramatically so mm-hmm. maybe you can tell a little bit about that journey and you know why you all moved to the b2b side of it and things 
Yeah, I think uh, you guys invested in B2C, right? And uh, when we were scaling the B2C, when we realized that... Uh, uh, the 2% problem, yeah, was that the 2% problem was not going away. Yeah, the 2% percent problem is not going <laughs> away. And then uh, it will require a lot of investment. And I think I realized that that's not... Look, uh, it's the problem also has to match with the founder's DNA. Like if if there's no match with the problem statement, right? And for, you know, irrespective of the money you could have, you know, we had the money in the bank account, right? But we we said, look, you know, I don't think uh, there is a viable business that we can build uh, as founders uh, in this space, right? And um, and thanks to Sanjay and everyone, you guys all open up your network. We said, look, we think that there is probably an opportunity in the B two B space. uh doing something very similar and uh, you guys introduced us to all the cfos and ceos in your network here we spent next 3 months meeting only meeting them trying to understand that uh, what are they getting from their partner bank which problem what problem statement do they have so two problems that came out very clearly right uh, one was that uh, uh, there was no fine level control on the uh transactions that their employees are doing so they're like, like look india is a control freak market to be very frank like low trust control freak right uh, where uh, the the cfo the finance guy wants to control and manage saying who is spending what where how right and uh, so second was that look a lot of data is actually sitting in the bank systems that does not really flow very seamlessly to our internal systems and then we have different workflows to uh, sort of manage that data to push that data into the accounting systems and what not right? like these are the two core problems that we identified and then we said okay uh, i think we'll pivot from b2c to b2b and uh, the first segment that we focus was like we'll launch a corporate card uh, with a very fine level control and a very real time transaction visibility targeting the sme segment right that was the first product that we launched um look i think we were trying to scale the sme segment we realized that uh, uh it's a story of too many pivots but <laughs> we realized that it is almost impossible to make money in the sme segment also because, <laughs> because the cost of acquisition to acquire uh, a sme customer does not justify the revenue that you will make from that sme customer and in india smes they don't pay any saas fee to any software subscriber they like they still don't pay it i, I don't think like look at it uh, the licensing cost of uh, uh, your accounting software which is tally which is the, like the most used software in the country right is 10000 rupees annually right like i mean you uh, i'm saying that's the maximum you can probably get right uh, and that also people are sort of using uh one of the, somebody else is paid version is paid version and what not like cracked version of tell people don't want to pay those 10000 rupees only yeah. also even when the entire business it, is running it, on that software it's changing but it's changing if now. you rewind to 6 8 years ago it probably yeah. wasn't the case yeah. so we realized uh, i think in the sme segment also that it's probably very hard to make money and uh, then we kept moving up the ladder and uh, uh, you will say one thing though about uh, which is a um, um, for uh, entrepreneurs are listening right happy to incredibly quick price discovery so initially we said it was going to be 50 rupees a card right i recall that conversation we said people said it was kind of expensive you know do we get free atm with this said uh, no because atm is 15 rupees per withdrawal that we pass on the cost we don't make money then people said no 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 my bank gives me three free atms for my personal <laughs> debit card so we went back the next week and said okay how about is 100 rupees three, three free atm you got sure no problem right charge me 5 rupees more even, even if they did do the three free right but the perception was there right yeah. then we said you know what let's double the price let's see if the market will bear 200 rupees right so went back and said okay 200 rupees includes three free atms no problem then we tried 400 rupees market rejected out is okay so the right number is 200 <laughs> then i remember shailendra at the board meeting saying why don't we try a 10 card minimum right they went customer said okay so 2000 for 50 rupees a month suddenly became 2000 rupees a month nice. right it was still not meaningful enough because of the customer acquisition cost because as they say in india the sme wants to be treated like an enterprise, like an enterprise. right and totally 
uh, so even at 2000 it probably didn't make sense but it was funny how you know and and lot of startups the reason i brought this up a lot of startups say oh you know first i'll prove my product then i'll test the pricing and then no for the first customer if they're not willing to pay you don't have a product right because somebody has to find this as a pain point right and that person will be willing to pay even now right so sometimes they're too shy and too scared to ask but it's very important to ask absolutely right? and i think we would have probably lost three years if we just been trying to say okay let's just get it to work and then see about the price it will continue sorry yeah, yeah i think uh then we kept moving up the ladder sanjay we from sme to started targeting more mid market and uh, we realized that in mid market you can ask for uh, the oti to recover your cost of acquisition you can charge one time uh, fee a set up fee to them and they don't mind they are used to uh, there was a time when our sales team would basically hesitate to even ask for like a 25000 bucks right uh, today we charge like a 15 lakhs oti 20 lakhs oti to these large corporates right uh, now um, i think we have learned a lot in this entire journey uh, of course uh, look uh, our both our founders had no background in enterprise sales and closing some of these large deals uh, and what not but i think today is uzu of india uses app today right? like from pwc kpmg bajaj maruti adani group imam group like uh, pretty much uh, hero itc all uh, uh, large corporates are our customers today right so that's uh, but i think when we moved away from the sme uh, uh, focused on more bid market and large enterprises i think that uh, that's something that we then kept focusing on for a uh, for a good long period till covid hit <laughs> uh, and yeah got it no so that's actually an interesting segue back to the whole enterprise side of things right because uh now that you're at uh, perfios and you know the, the business of uh, is really sen- selling infrastructure plays to banks right or to financial services providers and institutions here uh, both at the parent company as well as in the account aggregator services um so there is this notion that indian companies don't pay for software right at least that is the perception that startups have got other than paying the big guys the big global guys right so how you know how has this evolved you know maybe you can start a little bit with the description of the business itself right what are the products who are the target customers etc and how does one build a sustainable business by selling to indian uh, uh, banks and financial services providers um just by way of background uh, perfios started out in 2009 um and recently became a unicorn right well i mean that's a that's a label yeah. um it's just a label it's 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 important though because i think a lot of hard work goes into it everybody thinks about these overnight sensations and it's i've always said it takes 15 it years takes to 15 become years. an overnight yeah. success and in that overnight success took, took us 15 yeah. 16 years there you go i mean <laughs> um people don't look at the 15 16 years they look at that 15 16 seconds of fame <laughs> <laughs> uh not denying the fact that the market has recognized um what value we bring and investors have recognized it but i think the back story is important to understand uh, we actually started perfios uh, as a b2c personal financial management product right mm-hmm. um the two co-founders govi and bichak as they are called uh, they had exited their earlier venture and uh, then they were like you know still dissatisfied and figuring out why is it so hard to get all my financial information into one place mm. why do i have to look at six emails and five websites and that problem has still not been solved by the way in 2024 right so back in the day in 2009 they said okay they're techies so let's hack away to get this information done so they set up a pfm app and at the back at the back end the secret sauce was being able to extract data from let's say a net banking uh, protocol or maybe your email pdf statements being able to extract data categorize it and then analyze it and output in a way that made sense to the customer customer doesn't understand you know some of the verbiage and some of the transaction uh, you know descriptions that happen customer ask is very simple how much cash flow do i have what's my net worth what are my expenses what's my emi servicing capability so on and so forth so the product was brilliant 
even if I'm saying so, I mean, vested interest and all that stuff. But, sure. Um, it, it worked very well for a very, very small niche of customers. Uh, but it was so hard to get people to pay for a product. I mean, to, uh, to your point, I mean, especially in the B2C world where uh, it's, it was near impossible to get people to pay and do, forget price discovery and all that kind of stuff. So we tried a whole bunch of things, right? We went to CAs, we went to wealth managers and said, is this a product you'd like to use on behalf of your customer? They said, yeah, but can't pay. Right? So for the, the first three years were really a struggle trying to figure out, a, you know, a monetization model until we realized that, hey, a bank is trying to solve the exact same problem of understanding your 360 of, a, uh, of your financial profile. What is your net net worth? What are your liabilities? What's your cash flow? If I lend to Sanjay, does he have the cash flows to service the EMIs over a period of the next six months, nine months? It's an analysis problem. It's a, it's a data aggregation analysis problem. So once we got our first two or three paying customers, I mean, the large banks, I mean, Kotak has been there for us since inception. Bajaj has been there since, for, uh, since forever. Right? That's when the pivot happened, saying that stop wasting time in uh, building a building a B2C product. In fact, we shut it down six months back. Uh, a lot of people are very unhappy about it, but hey, we have to prioritize. So once we made this pivot and then we said, okay, we are an analytics partner for lenders and over a period of time, lenders, wealth managers, insurers, then the engine started moving. Mm. Right? So to your point of our customers willing to pay, I think I would phrase the question slightly differently. Do you have something that is so unique and so central and core to your customers' workflows that you earn the right to be paid? Right? Um, no disrespect to any other business models, but if you're simply a gateway, of, a payment gateway, right? No disrespect to any of the payment gateways or any It's okay, it can be disrespectful, doesn't matter. Right. But if you can be replaced at the click of a button or, or some eventuality and there is no stickiness there, and obviously your ability to charge a premium goes away. What we realized, and we realized this uh, about two, year, two or three years into our journey in a B2B uh, sense, is that we have to stop selling APIs. We have to start selling solutions. Mm. We have to talk to a banker like a banker. Right? And that's when our hiring strategy changed. Uh, the current CEO, Sabya, joined us in 2016, I think. Hardcore banker. Um, very, very clued in into all the things that, that a bank really cares about in terms of risk management, analytics, you know, uh, recovery, NPAs and all that stuff. And that's when the business started really scaling. Right? We were able to go and have a conversation with the chief risk officer about exactly the pain points that he's trying to solve. Or we were able to go and talk to a uh, head of retail banking to say, okay, these are your pain points in distribution or cross-sell or upsell and all this stuff. Let me solve this for you. Right? So that earns you the credibility to say that these guys actually understand my problem. They're building a solution to my problem, not to ju just their business. Uh, and it's not like we don't have competition. Competition comes every week, every month there is competition. Uh, the first point they will attack you in is on price. Mm. Uh, I think our ability to defend pricing in a B2B world is a direct function of the depth of your domain understanding and your, the, 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 the completeness of your solution stack. We started life as an analytics product. Today we have a full stack solution, right? Uh, all the way from identity, identity verification, onboarding, decisioning, credit monitoring, the full stack is there. I mean, you could literally, if you have a bank license and you want to set up operations, we could actually get you running in six weeks time. That's the promise that we have. Right? So, um, a lot of this recently has been um, inorganic as well. Uh, organic growth got us to a certain stage. The headline uh, transaction that you would have seen was a company called Karza that we uh, acquired about a couple of years back. A uh, phenomenal bunch of people, uh, great solution stack, and it's just complemented the uh, you know solution uh, completely. Right? Um, so, long answer to a short question, but do Indian enterprises pay for software? Absolutely, yes. Is it easy? Not at all. It takes a lot of patience and 
you know, building the right solutions and having the right conversations to be extract to be able to build value and you know, uh, demand your fair share. Dear listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app for free and you'll be the first one to know when new episodes are available. Just search for Prime Venture Partners podcast in Apple Podcast, Spotify, Castbox or however you get your podcasts. Then hit subscribe. And if you have enjoyed the show, we would be really grateful if you leave us a review on Apple Podcast. To read the full transcript, find the link in the show notes.